Um, we are starting our time of stewardship, and it's actually a very exciting time. So, it's, so some folks go, oh, no, they're doing the stewardship campaign, but actually it's really, it's really a great time. And so we're not, that's not my message today, but we're starting our stewardship season, and I know a wonderful woman, our very own Mary Lou, who um, are continuing our series with King David and those characters that were very, very close to him in his life. So we're looking at really what I think we can clarify as unexpected, which is David's um, sin. He's remembered for one, um, well, one sin that stands out, I think, uh, that many of us um, have probably heard about before, which is his, uh, his time with Bathsheba. And David's a very famous figure. You know, as we look at the Old Testament, he really stands out as the greatest king. Perhaps the greatest person. I mean, he's, he's the, described by Scripture as a man after God's own heart. I mean, he's so profound, he's called a man after God's own heart. And in fact, when God introduced the Savior of the world to the world, he defines him as the son of David. Jesus is defined. The perfect one, the Messiah, the, the, the Lamb that comes, the, that, that Savior that comes for us to redeem us is defined as the Son of David. And we see here a glimpse into this great leader, this man known for worship and love of God and his great faith. And we see what happens when he begins to compromise in the area of morality and what's right before God. So we're going to be in 2 Samuel chapter 11, verses 1 through 27. 2 Samuel chapter 11, verses 1 through 27. I want to encourage you to open your pew Bibles and be in God's Word with me. I'm going to read it for us, but I would really, I would really encourage you to be in the Word with me. It's a very powerful piece of scripture, and I pray that all of us would learn and see something in it today that we haven't seen before. Hear the word of God. In the spring, at the time when kings go off to war, David sent Joab out with the king's men and the whole Israelite army. They destroyed the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah. But David remained in Jerusalem. One evening, David got up from his bed, and he walked around on the roof of the palace. From the roof, he saw a woman bathing. The woman was very beautiful. And David sent someone to find out about her. The man said, isn't this Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite. David sent messengers to get her. She came to him, and he slept with her. She had purified herself from her uncleanliness. Then she went back home. The woman conceived and sent word to David, saying, I am pregnant. When David sent this word, so David sent this word to Joab, send me Uriah the Hittite. And Joab sent him to David. When Uriah came to him, David asked him how Joab was, how the soldiers were, and how the war was going. Then David said to Uriah, go down to your house and wash your feet. So Uriah left the palace, and, and a gift from the king was sent after him, but Uriah slept at the entrance to the palace with all his master's servants, and did not go down to his house. When David was told Uriah did not go home, he asked him, Haven't you come from a distance? Why don't you go home? But Uriah said to David his king, The ark and Israel and Judah are staying in tents, and my master Joab and my lord's men are camped in the open fields. How can I go to my house to eat and drink and lie with my wife? As surely as you live, I will not do such a thing. Then David said to him, Stay here one more day, and tomorrow I will send you back. So Uriah remained in Jerusalem that day and the next. At David's invitation, he ate and drank with him, and David made him drunk. 
But in the evening, Uriah went out to sleep on his mat among his master's servants. He did not go home. In the morning, David wrote a letter to Joab, and he sent it with Uriah. In it, he wrote, Put Uriah in the front line where the fighting is fiercest. Then withdraw from him so he will be struck down and die. When Joab had the city under siege, he put Uriah at a place where he knew the strongest defenders were. When the men of the city came out and fought against Joab, some of the men in David's army fell. Moreover, Uriah the Hittite died. Joab sent David a full account of the battle. He instructed the messenger, when you have finished giving the king this account of the battle, the king's anger may flare up and he may ask you, why did you get so close to the city to fight? Didn't you know they would shoot arrows from the wall? Who killed the Bimelech, son of Jerubesheth? Didn't a woman throw an upper millstone on him from the wall so that he died in Thebes? Why did you get so close to the wall? If he asks you this, then say to him, also your servant Uriah the Hittite is dead. The messenger set out, and when he arrived, he told David everything Joab had sent him to say. The messenger said to David, the men overpowered us and came out against us in the open, but we drove them back to the entrance to the city gate. Then the archers shot arrows at your servant from the wall, and some of the king's men died. Moreover, your servant Uriah the Hittite is dead. David told the messenger, say this to Joab, don't let, don't let this upset you. The sword devours one as well as another. Press the attack against the city and destroy it. Say this to encourage Joab. When Uriah's wife heard that her husband was dead, she mourned for him. After the time of mourning was over, David had her brought to his house, and she became his wife and bore him a son. But the thing David had done displeased the Lord. Let's pray together. Lord, we ask that your word would speak to us today. Lord, let us learn from your word this morning. Help us to see that at the heart of it, what is revealed to us is you. Who you are, how you love, what you've called us to. How abundantly good you are in the midst of every situation. And Lord, we ask that this morning there would be conviction and guidance and new revelation for each of us. That you would be glorified as we look at your word today. We are grateful, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. I love this the series we've had about David. Um, the man that he was. The way that he led. What defined him. We learn from him in so many areas. A man who was not perfect and yet was called a man after God's own heart. God's hand-picked leader for his people. Don Muma is a great friend of ours. We've had him here before. He was the pastor of Bel Air for about 30 years. We all know Don. Um, who've been here for a while. He is now retired. Um, and back in the 50s, actually in 1953, he was the, uh, he was the fourth um, vote getter in the Heisman Trophy as a linebacker and a center. And it, it afforded him a lot of opportunities to proclaim his testimony. He got saved by Bill Bright, his senior year of college at UCLA. And he was given the opportunity to serve with some people and give testimony in a lot of secular realms. And one of the things he did was he gave his testimony at a, at a, at a packed Coliseum, um, you know, the L.A. Coliseum, when it was packed in 1953. And as a result, Billy Graham invited him to be an evangelist with him on the 1953 London Crusade. And so Don worked with Billy Graham for a whole crusade for months in London. 
And when I talk with him about Billy Graham, the testimony of Billy Graham is not that he was the smartest or the most profound, but he was really, really good at clarity and boundaries. He was very committed to what God had called him to, and he protected himself against any moral failures. There was not one night in Billy Graham's illustrious career, he's 96 now, where he ever slept in his hotel room alone. Either he was with his wife, or he had Cliff Barrows, his music leader, or some other key leader in his room at all times. He was always above reproach. In fact, they even set out uh, guidelines for their ministry team when they went to different cities. For example, when they were in London, some people back in the 50s would equate going to movies with, you know, a naughty lifestyle, so they had a no-movies policy because they didn't want what they did in their private time to take away from the gospel message. Billy Graham has been committed to God's calling in his life and very um, morally aware. And as a result, he is known today as one of the greatest Christians in the modern world in the last 200 years. And we look at the story, and I, I, would, I would pose to you this. These, these stories in the Old Testament are there for a very important reason. They actually reveal to us how God loves us and how God walks with us in all the different stages of life. We're finding out about God, not just about a person like David. And we can learn a lot from David in this powerful account we see about God's justice and mercy we see how God is abundant to forgive when we're willing to be truthful about what we've done and turn so so we see David it says to us at the very beginning that the, the, the armies went out to battle so every year there was a time when the armies would go out to battle and the kings would go with their armies and certainly the army of, of, of Israel was one of the most powerful and the mightiest and David had had enormous success because God was with him. Yet at this point he decides to send the army out and stay behind. And we're told that, that his palace overlooks, you would imagine, a number of homes. But in one home he looks out and he sees a woman bathing. Very beautiful. Now in this culture, it's very unlike our current culture. Women in those days were completely covered, including a veil. That was the standard of a pair in the time of David. Everyone, they had head coverings, they had you know, dresses, they, they, their bodies were covered. And yet, David is walking on his roof and he sees a very beautiful woman and he stops and lingers. And he sees something that he likes. We get this word lust from when he sees what he likes and immediately he takes it in and he sends to find out more about her identity. We see the same picture of desiring something in Genesis chapter 3. Remember the snake goes to Eve and says, Oh Eve, eat of that fruit. It's really good. And she looks at it and the Bible tells us that she deeply desires it. She wants it. And let me ask you, for each of us, when we look at something that we deeply desire, what do we oftentimes set out to do? How do we get it? I want that. I want that. I deserve that. That will make me happy. I mean, advertising has, has built a whole industry off of this. Making you want what you don't know you need. Right? They have, these, they have lots, of, they have lots of, of plans to, to stir up in us a desire for something that we don't actually need. And the most successful companies are able to do that in a number of ways. He sends for Bathsheba. He finds out who she is. 
He's told she's the wife of Uriah the Hittite. He's a foreigner, but he's also one of David's mighty men. 2 Samuel 23 tells us this. David had 30 mighty men who had been outcasts, and through his, his time as a soldier, he, he took these outcasts, and 30 of them became giant killers. They became great champions. He's told that Bathsheba is Uriah's wife, and yet he calls for her and brings her into his bedroom. There's a couple of side notes that we look at here. The first one is, it's not so hard to believe that David knew where she was, and he knew who she was, and he had an intention here to get her alone. Send all the army out, there she was. I mean, it tells us that she was not only Uriah's wife, but also the daughter of Eliam, who was one of David's personal bodyguard. It makes sense to, to know that he knew her. He'd seen her. He had an idea of who she was. The other thing is this. We see with Bathsheba... Um, The picture we have is that, you know, like any other block, there would be, you know, backyards. So we have a backyard here, a fence, a backyard here, a fence, a backyard here. And so she's in her, her, her space, only there's one place that can see in her backyard. It's the high roof of the palace. Now, do you suppose that she knew who walked on the roof of the palace? I mean, let me ask you, if President Obama was your neighbor, would you know he was your neighbor? And we see a lack of modesty with her towards the king. My, my, uh, my wife is very modest, and even when, we don't, even when you can't see in the, the windows, she still closes the curtains. I mean, no one's ever going to get a chance to see in and see anything. Very aware of that, which is good. But yet, here we have Bathsheba. Who is, who, who, who is not modest about herself, allowing for the king to see her and desire her. And we have this picture, really, of sin. I mean, all that David has has been given to him by God, and yet he sees something that he knows is wrong, and yet he makes justifications for why he should go get it. And I think it's actually very, very easy for that to happen to us today. I mean, it's so easy to justify so many things. To justify and say, you know what? You know, yeah, I know that's bad, but I mean, is it really, it's not going to be that bad if I look at that, if I do that, if I compromise here. You know, this company that I work for, I mean, they're worth a lot of money. They're not going to miss 100 bucks here, 200 bucks there. I, I, I'm a good manager. I'm not paid enough. I, I do the, the walk-up at night. I close up. They're not going to miss a couple hundred bucks here. And pretty soon it goes on for a year or two years, and thousands of dollars are missing. We can justify it to ourselves. We can justify sin in a way that makes it really seem okay. And we see here David has many opportunities to turn away. I mean, the first time he sees her, he can say, whoa, shouldn't look at that, and he could have walked the other way. But he stops and lusts for what he sees. Once he finds out that she is the wife of Uriah, she could say, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry, and write a nice letter with a fruit basket for Uriah. I saw your wife, I'm so sorry, I didn't know she was your wife, I apologize. It's okay. But he chooses to justify to himself, and he goes, and he takes her as his own. He loses his moral bearings because of what he wants. He compromises God's, God's direction and God's clarity and, and God's morality for what he wants to claim for himself.
and I pose to you this, I think it's actually very easy for us to fall into that trap. I think that we can become dissatisfied in our lives, and, and it's easy to justify to ourselves doing something that goes against God's heart, God's direction, God's best. Um, I started here in, in 2008, and um, you know, for 14 months I commuted back and forth from Arcadia to um, Sherman Oaks, and I was working a lot of hours, being a lot of people, starting programs and things. And um, my mentor said to me at one point, um, when I was meeting with him, you know, so he asked how my ministry was, and then he said, okay, well, how is, how is life in your marriage? How is life under the hood? Now, what's under the hood of a car? The engine. What makes it go? Well, we got the engine, right. But just, that, that, that's the thing that makes us go. It makes it go. And, 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 he, and he said, he said, how, he said how, how are you doing there? And at first I was like, oh, I'm fine. But the more time I spent in it, the more that I realized that I wasn't fine. And, and my wife and I had become very distant from each other to the point where I was noticing people that were attractive in a way that I shouldn't have been. And I realized that where we were needed to change. And so, um, thankfully, I had this mentor who spoke into my life, and, and we began a process of, of counseling that went on for, for quite some time, and it was able to help us repair the connection that we lost. But, but I, I, look at, I look at that time of life, and, I, and I've, I've seen so many pastors that have fallen, especially in a sexual sin. That's a huge killer in, in, the, in the Christian world. And I understand how it could happen. I, you get... You get distant, you don't feel cared for, you don't feel loved, and all of a sudden someone comes to your office and says, oh, you're amazing. You're handsome. You're wonderful. I wish that, that I knew God like you did. It's never happened. Don't worry. Not even close. Not even once. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> But you can see how it can happen. And you, know, and you have some of these people who are very, they're wildly successful. And there's temptation that, it, that, it, that, it, that presents itself, and it's easy to fall back if we're not careful, if we don't set boundaries, if we don't commit to work on our issues. And David got away from it. He bought into his own press. He began to use all that power that God gave him, and he used it for good, for justice, for worship, for righteousness. He built this, this little country with, with God's anointing and blessing from this little pity country to this world power. And we see in the scripture where multiple times it says that David sends for his servant. He sends for Bathsheba. He sends for Uriah. He's using his power that he used all of his life to do great things for God. He begins to turn and use it for sin. And it builds and it builds until all of a sudden he's got a problem with his sin that he can't control. Bathsheba is pregnant. And it happens to us all the time. Oh, this won't be so bad if I do this little thing or that little thing or that little thing. And all of a sudden it's at a point where I can't control it anymore. And now I've got to do something else. I mean, we read the scripture. Who's the hero in the scripture? Who's the holy person? It's Uriah. Uriah is amazing. He's not even an Israelite, but he loves God really more than David in this chapter. I won't be with my wife because I believe, David, in what you're about. I believe in God with our people. I believe in my, in my fellow soldiers. I would never dishonor them by going home and enjoying that pleasure when they can't enjoy it themselves. You see, Uriah is committed. He's got it all right. And David, something happened. He got away from it. And he it, and it, and it got caught up in, doing, in getting compromised in what he shouldn't have been compromised in. And as a result, Uriah, who is innocent, is killed. And, and we always have victims in our sin. My gosh, it, it happens so much. 
That happens so much. I think the moral compromise is easy for us. And the world and the church need people who are willing to say, even if I've fallen short here, I'm not going to keep doing it. I'm not going to keep doing it. I'm going to understand, I'm going to know what's right, and I'm going to choose what's right even when it's hard. And I'm going to, because of that, I'm going to receive the blessings in the goodness of God, even if it takes a while. Even if in the short term it's going to be harder, in the long term it's going to be worth it. And I wonder if for any of us, are there any relationships or an area of workplace or an area of some part of our lives where we've compromised because it's been easy and as a result there's an area of struggle or hurt or sin that we're carrying with us. And the reality is that we can't, we can't ever experience that fullness that God has for us if in some part of our lives we're compromised when it comes to God. This is not to make you feel bad, but it's to help us understand the gospel truth. And, and God, in all of his love and goodness, says, you know what, David, this, this, this can't, it can't go this way. You can't hide this from me. I've called you to better than this. David's an amazing man, but he, and he was far too awesome to act in this way. And so God sends the prophet Nathan here. The next chapter, 2 Samuel 12, verses 1 through 13, we see, him, we see Nathan come to David. And now remember, David's a great king. I'm sure him and the prophet are like really good friends, probably out in the terrace having coffee. Hey, my great friend Nathan. Hi, King David. We all love God together. God's amazing. Yes, he is. And he says, Nathan, how are you? Well, David, let me tell you a story about a guy in your kingdom. And he says, great, tell me, my friend Nathan. He says, there were two men in a certain town, one rich and the other poor. The rich man had a very large number of sheep and cattle, but the poor man had nothing, only one little ewe lamb that he bought. And he raised it, and he grew up with him and his children. It shared in his food. It was like his child. He drank from his cup and even slept in his arms. It was like a daughter to him. Now a traveler came to the rich man who had everything, but the rich man refrained from taking one of his own sheep or cattle to prepare a meal for the traveler who had come to him. Instead, he took the ewe lamb that belonged to the poor man and prepared it for the one who had come to him. David hears the story with Nathan, and he burns with anger against the person who, who, had, who had taken from the poor man. And he says, as surely as the Lord lives, the man who did this deserves to die. David has called forth his own judgment. And he's right. He must pay for that lamb four times over. But he did such, a, he did such a, a thing and he had no pity. Then Nathan says to David, you're the man. You are that man. This is what the Lord, the God of Israel says. I anointed you king. I, get, I delivered you from the hand of Saul who was persecuting you. Let's go to verse 8. I gave you your master's house and your master's wives into your arms. I gave you the house of Israel and Judah. And if all this had been too little, I would have given you even more. God says, I've given you everything. Why did you despise the word of the Lord? By doing what is evil in, in God's eyes. You struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword. You took his wife to be your own. You killed him with the sword of the Ammonites. Now, therefore, the sword will never depart from your house because you despised me and took the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your own. Verse 11. This is what the Lord says. Out of your household, uh, let's, let's go down. You do this in secret, but I will do this thing in broad daylight before all of Israel. Then David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. Nathan replied, the Lord has taken away your sin. You're not going to die. This is a really big deal, you guys. Look at David's response. You're right. I screwed up. I sinned. But he didn't want to do it anymore. He turned from what he had done. 
He, he confessed that he had done wrong and he turned. He didn't go away from God. And the reply immediately is, God has taken away your sin. God wants to remove that sin from us. I, I love this, this scripture that we have here. 2 Corinthians 5, 18 through 19, Paul tells us this. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting men's sins against them. He is not counting our sins against us. He's reconciling us back to himself. His whole goal, his whole desire is to say, in spite of everything else, I want you with me. Nothing is too bad. In fact, the minute you say, I'm sorry, I'm going to repent and not do it anymore, it's forgiven. You're back with me. That's God's whole desire. Christ came for this. Not for condemnation. God's not sitting there in the ticket book saying, oh, you did that? You're going to pay for it later. He's saying, you did that, you're never going to pay for it. Yes. That's good news. Mm -hmm. But we've got to, as a people, as a church, we've got to stop morally compromising. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's the message. We've got to stop living in compromise when it comes to morality and, and biblical values. And as Christians, we live in a world where, I mean, people who do biblical things are thought of as weird. Now, I counseled a, I counseled a couple their week, and, and they were not living together even though they are going to get married. And their friends were giving them a hard time. Why are you spending all that extra money with two apartments? Seriously. People look at the things of God, the ways of God, and they say, what is wrong with you? And yet, and yet, there's a divine invitation to do it right. To live holy, to not compromise God's ways. To say we're gonna we're gonna choose to be different. We're gonna honor God in how we live, in how we love, in the things we do, and how we treat each other, and how we forgive each other, and how we are sexually, morally, with our eyes. With our hearts. And I know we talk in here all the time about, about purpose and God's love for us and our identity and all of those things are abundantly true, but we can't lose sight of the fact that we're called to a better standard. To a higher standard. And, and, and when we are able to live in this way, we are able to reap the benefit that God's invited us to, which is that life in the full, that John 10.10, 10, I come that they might have life in the full, but we can't have it if we're compromised in the things of God. That's a, that's a good thing. It's not a bad thing. It's a good thing. I mean, this is an important part of the Christian walk. It's an important part of the Christian walk. That I, that I can say before God, Lord, I, I know what's wrong or I've done wrong before, but I'm going to commit to not doing wrong anymore. I'm going to have accountability. I'm, I'm, I'm going I'm to have ways that, that people will, will know what I'm about, what I'm doing. I'll have people that are safe that I can sow into, that I can trust, that are going to help me do it right. And I'm going to turn and get help to not keep doing the same stuff. Because God, you're worth it. Because the people that I love are worth it. Because the place that I've been called to is, is about you. And the great truth is that the minute that we confess we've done it and that we don't want it anymore, God says you're forgiven. Live now in light of my mercy and my grace. Don't do it anymore and actually be someone who can help others to find this freedom from sin. Let's pray together. Lord, there, there are always consequences from decisions that we make that are against your direction for us and your desire for us. 
But we thank you, Lord, that the moment that we're willing to turn from it, and really turn from it, not just in word, but in action, and reality, and truth, and there's so many things you've given us, Lord, to, to navigate those hard waters, to find that victory. There's, there's, there's so many support groups and good counselors and, and healing ministries like the Sozo ministry that we have a, a relationship with here. And there's so many tools you've given us for success. Lord God, give us honesty about sin. Lord, put inside of us an awareness, a radar for what is right, that we would strive that way. We would give ourselves boundaries. We would get with good people who would help us be an account for our ability. Lord, give us courage to do what is hard so that, that the long-term reward would be abundant and fully realized. Lord, let us learn from David. And experience the fullness of that passage, that promise that you give us, that, that you've come to give us life in the full. Lord, give us a radar that we would stop compromising wherever it is in our lives. And trust you to be who you promise as we are faithful as we are holy and righteous in every possible way. And Lord God, thank you for your promise that the moment that we confess and turn away from it, that you are abundant to forgive. Let us be like David, that we would never go away from you when we screw up, but that we would always press into you, Lord, and trust you to be God in our lives. With thankful hearts, Lord, we pray these things and we glorify you today that you would be seen in these ways in our lives. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's stand. Help us spread the message. Click on the donate button below or go to shermanoakspc.org forward slash donate. Thank you.